So anybody who's not here, raise your hand. <laughs> uh, of course, my two cronies in the back, uh, Tom and Rick. I want to say a special thank you to Tom and Rick who have been helping bring this traveling circus uh, to this classroom uh, every night. They were here last night uh, for the general class and, and here tonight. So it's really appreciated. Thank you so much. So how many got a chance to read chapter three? And how many are scared, very scared? Yeah. <laughs> you have to understand that there are four sections in this chapter in the new book. And each one of those sections could easily be a college class, a college semester. Um, components, AC circuits, DC circuits, resonance circuits. I mean, so what we're trying to do in two hours tonight is cover material that logically should take, you know, a year or two or whatever else. So we're just going to skim the surface, uh, and we're going to emphasize things uh, relative to the the test. Um, and we will get there. You will understand what we're talking about, but it still may be hazy tonight. Don't let that scare you. Okay? Um, are there any questions about any of the material that we covered last week? This is the response I normally get, but last night in the general class, I had a lot of questions, which about the first time. Okay, so let's get started tonight. We're going to talk about um, electricity, and a lot of us know something about electricity, but maybe not a lot. Um, but electrical current flows through conductors and does not flow through insulators, and so. But what are some good insulators to the flow of electrons? Can you think of any? Gold. No, gold is a good conductor. Yeah, insulator. Rubber. Rubber. Glass. 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 Wood. Wood. Yep, okay, so you got the idea. And, and good conductors, gold. Silver. Silver, Silver, copper. Yeah, okay, so we got it. And these are the, the standard insulators that you might see. Uh, for insulating the ends of antennas or insulating high voltage lines. And the design is actually purposeful. Uh, it's designed to increase the ability to resist high voltages. And we'll talk about voltage here in just a second. But you may have seen things like this. Conductors, the most common is the copper wire, whether it be solid or whether it be stranded. Um, and copper is a very good a conductor of electricity. Not the best, but it's a, it's a good one. So here on one picture is you know, a selection of insulators and a selection of conductors. And electricity is really the movement of an electrical charge through a conductor. And it's kind of like the uh, pictorial that you see here with the electrons moving from left to right uh, while the atoms of the uh, copper or, or aluminum, whatever the conductor is, stay in, in generally one spot. So the charge moves by the movement of electrons in one direction and charge in the other direction. I'm not going to go deep into that. We'll do that later on in the uh, general class. There are a couple of theories of, of current conduction. So here is another uh, pictorial showing electrons flowing. Uh, anyone know what that device is on the left? That's a battery. And you see the plus terminal on the right, on the right, on the top. And uh, so that means the negative terminal is on the bottom. And you see electrons flowing from the negative terminal when the switch is closed and lighting up the light bulb. So this is uh, an electric circuit or an electrical circuit uh, powered by a battery. So some key concepts, voltage, is the pressure that pushes current through a conductor. And a lot of times people will use the analogy of a water hose. 
Uh, you have water pressure coming from a, a water tower possibly, and that's what pushes water through the pipe. Well, the voltage is the pressure that pushes the, the electron current flow. A current is the flow of a charge through a conductor. Resistance is opposition to DC current flow. Um, and resistance is measured in ohms. We'll talk more about that here in a second. And power is the rate of energy used. And so you'll see appliances rated at, uh, this refrigerator uses 200 watts. That's the amount of power that the, the refrigerator uses, for example. And then circuit is any path through which a current can flow. So I stole this uh, diagram or this picture from a presentation that Dave Ivey gave last night to our general class because I thought it was uh, fairly uh, indicative. You see Mr. Volt there on the left, he's pushing amps through this conductor and Mr. Resistance on the top uh, with the ohm symbol is trying to restrict the flow. So this is what current flow through a conductor is all about. And here's a, a bit of information about voltage. We use the symbol E for electromotive force. Why we don't use V? Well, it's science. They have their own terminology. So E is the symbol for voltage. Current, the symbol is I. It comes from the French. And resistance, R. And voltage is measured in volts. Current is measured in amperes. And resistance, as I mentioned earlier, is measured in ohms uh, and uses the Greek letter omega uh, to depict ohms. So there are two kinds of voltage, two kinds of pressure used in an electric circuit. One we saw earlier was with the battery, where current flows only in one direction. But in all of our houses, we have these outlets on the wall and that is alternating current. And what happens there is that current flows in one direction for a short period of time and then flows back in the other direction. Well, that sounds kind of crazy. That's, that's you know, not simple like you know, DC. Why didn't we, you know, why don't we have DC coming out of our, our wall outlets? Well, Thomas Edison wanted us to have DC coming out of the wall outlets. In fact, in the, the early illumination wars, um, he was a very strong proponent of DC, but he lost. He lost to Nikolai Tesla and Westinghouse. Uh, and Tesla determined that it was very easy to transfer power over long distances if it was AC current. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And so in the end, Edison had to realize and had to you know, say, oh, yep, yeah, you're right, that's better. So that's why we use AC. But we have DC, which is like a battery that always stays in one direction and current flows from one terminal to the other. With AC, it's alternating back and forth in polarity. And it's depicted here on the right. Uh, that is called a sine wave. And that's actually what the voltage coming out of the wall outlet looks like. It's a sine wave at 60 cycles per second, or 60 hertz. And with a schematic, uh, here you see the direct current uh, with the current flowing only in one direction, where they're showing on the right alternating current with the, uh, the current going back and forth and back and forth in alternating directions. So the primary source of DC power are batteries. And car batteries, for example, are a really uh, powerful source of electrical energy. You do not want to drop a metal wrench across the terminals of a battery. Bad things will happen. One thing I'd like you to look ahead, uh, you don't have to do it right now, but um, on page 5-18 in your book is table 5.3. Uh, and you can take a peek at it right now. It outlines um, various different types of batteries that are common to amateur radio use. And what you need to know about is that the standard alkaline batteries or even the, the more cheaper carbon zinc batteries, those batteries, no matter what somebody says, are not rechargeable. They're one-time use batteries. 
uh, while um, nickel metal hydride, lithium ion, lead acid, gel cells, those are all rechargeable battery types, meaning that you can take current out of the batteries and later on put current back in to be stored for future use. George Simon Ohm, we're going to love him or hate him, but um, he's very uh, essential to electronics uh, and did a lot of uh, research uh, in um, uh, physicists, uh, physics. Uh, he's a German, um, and interestingly, uh, in Voice of America, which I worked for for about 20 years, one of my overseas assignments was to Munich, Germany. And I found myself in the Alter Friedhof in uh, uh, Munich, and as I'm walking along, I nearly trip over George Simon Ohm's grave. Uh, he's buried in Munich. Um, and what we do with uh, Mr. Ohm is we have a relationship between voltage, current, and resistance. Now, this isn't it. We saw this last week. Remember this diamond shape where we were talking about the speed of light in this pyramid on top and the frequency on the left and the wavelength on the right, and we were able to calculate the wavelength if we knew the frequency, or we were able to calculate the frequency if we knew the wavelength. So this kind of pyramid or circle arrangement is common in electronics. It, it helps us remember things. Well, Ohm's law is very much like this. We have voltage or electromotive force on the top. We have current, uh, or the I, on the left. And we have resistance on the right. And what this allows us to do, if you cover up the thing that you want to find. For example, if I want to find the current and I know the voltage and I know the resistance. Well, what this tells me is if I cover up the I symbol, there's E over R. That's the formula. If you know the voltage and you know the resistance, you can easily calculate the current flow through a circuit or through a component. Likewise, if I cover it up the R, that's E over I. And that's a way to find out the resistance uh, of a component. And here's another way to look at it. Um, if you block out one of them, this pyramid is all, it allows you to kind of remember these three formulas. So you can calculate resistance, current flow, or voltage. And EIR, I always say, is the misspelling of ear. So think of ear, but with an I in it. There's another formula for power. And um, James Watt was involved in this. And the power in watts is the P, I is current, and E is voltage. And so, again, if you know two of these variables, you can find the third through this relationship by doing the same sorts of things. So here we are, the famous pyramids of ear pie. Well, maybe not so famous. And if you know those relationships, you can actually calculate all of these formulas, which you don't have to know. <laughs> you don't have to memorize. But Ohm's law and the power formula would be good to know. So here we have a series circuit. And this is a pictorial. Uh, and what we have is a battery as the power source going through a switch and it goes through each of the filaments of these three lamps. This is the standard inexpensive Christmas tree light string. And what happens with a series circuit is if one of the bulbs burns out, none of the bulbs light up because the current flows through each and every one of the bulbs. And so then you have to take it down and start substituting and hope you get lucky and, and find the burned out bulb. So this is a series circuit, and that was a pictorial. This is known as a schematic diagram. And the schematic has symbols for various things. We talked about the battery earlier. Uh, the uh, diagonal lines are symbols for resistors. And resistors are devices that are designed to resist the flow of DC current. And so the resistors here are, are substituting for the lamps. 
That was a series circuit. This is a parallel circuit. And with this, you have the power source, again, a battery, and you have current flowing, but you notice that the current divides up and goes through each lamp individually. In this case, if a lamp burns out, the other three will keep shining. And here's a schematic representation of a parallel circuit. Okay, this is, this is my memory aid for you. Come ride the little train that is rolling down the tracks to the junction. Forget about your cares, it is time to relax at the junction. So what we're talking about here are the junction between two components. And here we have a junction between R1 and R2. And in a series circuit at the junctions, the current through R1 is exactly the same as the current through R2. It's like a series circuit, and so the current has to be the same. Whereas a, with a junction of two parallel devices, R3 and R4, the current will divide up. And you don't know exactly how the current will divide up unless you know the values of those components, the values of the resistors. And if you do, then you can calculate how much current goes in one path, how much current goes in another path. If the two devices were equal in resistance, then half of the current would go through one and half of the current would go through the other. So that's the difference between a junction and in a series device and a junction uh, between two parallel devices. And here we have what is commonly known as a voltage divider. You have a large voltage coming in, but you don't want a large voltage. You want a smaller voltage to, to do whatever you need to do. So you can use these two resistors, and let's say they're equal value. If that's the case, if you put 10 volts into this voltage divider, the voltage at the midpoint there will be 5 volts because the voltage will divide up across the two resistors if they are of equal magnitude. And the voltage across parallel connected resistors is the same. And we'll talk about the meters here and, and metering and measuring voltage. But if you have 12 volts coming in, there'll be 12 volts across each one of these resistors because they're connected in parallel. So some folks will say, hey, I, I think I've got a short circuit in my device. Well, this is what a short circuit is. Normally you would want the, the current to flow from the battery into the lamp, but if something falls across the path, in this case of the lamp, and has very low resistance, it will take all of the current and not leave any current for the device that you want to, to do some work. So this is a short circuit. If you hear that, that's, that's what it means. And then the opposite is on the right here, that's an open circuit. If a wire breaks, if there's an open connection, then current obviously cannot flow. And a closed circuit is when the connections are, are made properly. So a meter, and there can be different types, they can be analog readout on the left or digital readout on the right, is something that displays an amplitude on a numbered scale. And you can have fixed meters that measure voltage or measure current or measure power. Uh, there are different devices for different purposes. But in, in general, a meter is something that displays an amplitude that we can interpret and, and use uh, for what we want to do. In connecting a voltmeter to measure voltage or an ammeter to measure current, the letter A on the meter on the top there is the ammeter, and it's measuring current flow. And I like to liken this to a turnstile at a ballpark that counts people coming in. Well, it's got to count all of the electrons or all of the current flowing, and so it's got to be in series with the circuit. So if you're connecting up an ammeter 
uh, to a circuit, it must be in series with that circuit. On the other hand, a voltmeter is measuring pressure, and so a voltmeter must be connected in parallel with the device under test. So in this case, there's a lamp, and the voltmeter is connected in parallel with the lamp. So ammeters in series, voltmeters in parallel. And you can have various kinds of multimeters. If you go to Home Depot or Lowe's, you'll see them sold there. You can find them also at Harbor Freight, but don't buy them at Harbor Freight. They're not accurate. <laughs> but uh, anyway, they're analog types with an analog meter scale, and they're digital types that'll read out there. So I want to share with you a little-known theory of electronics. Well, the guys in the back know it. But it's time for me to reveal to you that in electronics, everything works on smoke. True. Your radio, your TV, everything inside of it works on smoke. You think I'm kidding? You ever seen a device fail? All the smoke comes out. A multimeter, if you hook it up wrong, you can let the smoke out. Um, and so when you set the multimeter to the resistance scale, because you want to measure a resistor, but you put it across a live circuit, a voltage inside that has power, well, the meter will burn out. Actually, the, the voltage divider components will burn out, and the smoke will come up. So that is the smoke theory of electronics. If you're going to be using a meter to test for high voltage, you want to make sure that it's appropriate. Um, and so here is a, um, a meter probe that's going to be used to measure a very high voltage. And you notice how it's got protective rings there that you can't, your hand won't slip down and, and onto the active circuit. Um, meters themselves, too, you've got to make sure that you don't use a, a Harbor Freight meter to measure a 1,000-volt circuit when it's only rated for 600 volts. You're asking for trouble. You're going to let the smoke out. All right, this is unusual. We're going to talk about capacitors uh, here in a minute, but I need to interject this right now. So a capacitor we'll learn more about, but it's made up of two metal plates separated by an insulator. And it can be air, or it could be Teflon, or it could be some other material. But that's what a capacitor is. And if you have a large enough value capacitor, one of the characteristics of a capacitor is that it, it will allow current to flow through, DC current to flow through for a little period of time as it builds up an electrostatic charge on the plates. And as the electrons jump the gap and go over it, up until the time that it reaches capacity, so current will flow immediately and then taper off. So what do you think is going to happen in this circuit where we have a battery that's connected to the capacitor that's connected to the bulb when we first connect it up? Will the bulb light? The answer is yes. The bulb will briefly light because the capacitor will allow current flow short period of time, and then it will block current flow. Well, why am I saying that? Well, it's a way that you can test capacitors with an ohm meter. If you have a capacitor and you want to see if it's got any capacity, now here we're talking about electrolytic capacitors, fairly large value capacitors. You can put an ohm meter across it, and it'll show a low resistance, and then the meter will start swinging back up to a high resistance. So if you see something like that, there's probably a capacitor involved. All right, let's answer our first set of questions. <clears throat> Electrical current is measured in which of the following units? Electrical current. That's where you have that turnstile. It's measuring those things going past. They're measured in amps or amperes. That's electrical current. Electrical power is measured in which of the following units? 
That's the power that is being used by your refrigerator or a light bulb. Anybody remember the 100 watt light bulbs? That's measured in watts. And what is the name for the flow of electrons in an electric circuit? This is kind of a repeat of an earlier question. Current, that's current flow, correct. Measured in amps, correct, amperes, yes. So what is the name for a current that flows in only one direction? Direct current. Hey, you're doing fine. You're answering questions from the test. And what is the electrical term for the electromotive force that causes electron flow? That's the voltage, the pressure, the EMF. And which of the following is a good electrical conductor? That would be copper. And which of the following is a good electrical insulator? That would be glass. And what is the name for a current that reverses direction on a regular basis? That's AC, or alternating current. We have 120 volts AC coming out of a wall outlet. AC, alternating current. And which term describes the rate at which electrical energy is used? That's power, exactly right. And what is the basic unit of electromotive force? That's volts. And in which type of circuit is current the same through all of the components? That's a series circuit. The current is the same through all components in a series circuit. And in which type of circuit is voltage the same across all components? The voltage is the same across all components in a parallel circuit. The voltage is the same. The current is not. And Ohm's law, or actually this is the uh, Watt's law, power. What is the formula used to calculate electrical power in a DC circuit? Pi, that's a good start. You got P, P equals I, times R. I times E in this case, pi I E. Yeah. So power equals voltage E multiplied by current I. That's what we're talking about with that pi pyramid. And how much power, okay, now we're going to do a calculation. How much power is being used in a circuit when the applied voltage is 13.8 volts DC and the current is 10 amperes? So now we're using Ohm's law. That's the EIR. Oh, I'm sorry. No, we're using the, what? We're using the power formula, PIE. Sorry, sorry. PIE. We want to find P, so we cover it up, and we have I next to E, which means I times E. So 13.8 times 10 is 138 watts. I nearly steered you wrong there, sorry. And how much power is being used in a circuit when the applied voltage is 12 volts and the current is 2.5 amperes? So again, it's PIE, you cover up the P, I next to E, I times E, 12 times 2.5 would give you 30. And you'll want to do some practice uh, problems at home. How many amperes are flowing in a circuit when the applied voltage is 12 volts and the load is 120 watts? So here's the PIE pyramid. We know power, it's 120. And we know the voltage, which is 12, so it's 120 over 12, or 10. Um, yeah. In the book, it's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> oh, why? Because in the book, it, t it's, it comes out to 20, and it's, I kept, I had a question next to that saying, why not 10? They had a practice question in the book, and it's got, really? they switched yeah. it, they switched it to, to 240 and 20 amps. Okay. 240 watts 
But it, in the question, it's 12 and 120. It's your question uh, it's your for question, the wrong but, answer. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, this is a brand new book. Mm. And they will have um, errors in the first printings. So you found the first error. I kept saying, why not And 10? what page is that on? 3-7. 3-7. Okay, I'll take a look at that. And what formula is used to calculate current in a circuit? Now we're back to Ohm's law, EIR. E is on top, R is underneath it. I equals E over R, E divided by R. That's right. See that? And what formula is used to calculate voltage in a circuit? That's E on top, I, R. I multiplied by R. R. And what formula is used to calculate resistance in a circuit? E divided by I. All right, what is the resistance of a circuit in which a current of three amperes flows through a resistor connected to 90 volts? So we're trying to find R, and uh, we know the voltage is 90, and we know the current is three. So using the EIR Ohm's law, um, we have E, 90 over 3, so that would be 30 ohms. Resistance is measured in ohms. That's the unit of measure. And what is the resistance in a circuit for which the applied voltage is 12 volts and the current flow is 1.5 amperes? Here we would take the voltage, 12, Divide it by 1.5, and the answer is 8 ohms. And what is the resistance of a circuit that draws 4 amperes from a 12 volt source? R equals E divided by I, so it's 12 divided by 4, it's going to be 3. And what is the current flow in a circuit with an applied voltage of 120 volts and a resistance of 80 ohms? So here we're trying to find I. So I is equal to E, 120, divided by R, which is 80. So 120 divided by 80 is 1.5. And the unit of current flow is amperes. And what is the current flowing through a 100 ohm resistor connected across 200 volts? The voltage is on top, 200 divided by 100, it's going to be 2. It's not difficult, you just have to keep it organized. And what is the current flowing through a 24 ohm resistor connected across 240 volts? 240 volts, that's the E, that's on top. That would be 10 amperes, correct. And what is the voltage across a 2 ohm resistor if a current of 0.5 amperes, or half an amp, flows through it? Well, in this case, we want to know E, so that's on top, but I, R are next to each other, so it's I times R, so the voltage across that 2 ohm resistor will be 2 times 0.5 or 1 volt. And what is the voltage across a 10 ohm resistor if a current of 1 ampere flows through it? Same formula, we're trying to find E, and so that's I times R, or 10 times 1, I, I gotta remember, but anyway, it's 10 volts. 
And what is the voltage across a 10 ohm resistor if a current of 2 amperes flows through it? So we're again trying to find voltage and we know the resistance and we know the current flow so 10 times 2 or 20 volts. Is this making sense? Okay. And what happens to current at the junction of two components in series? It's unchanged. It's unchanged. They're the same. The current through one component is the same as the other. And what happens to current at the junction of two components in parallel? You see, it divides between them dependent on the values of the components. If we don't know the values, we don't know exactly how it divides, but it will divide up. And what is the voltage across each of two components in series with a voltage source? Well, think about this now. What is the voltage across each of the two components in series with a voltage source? Yeah, we don't know what the values are. We don't know what their resistance is. So it's determined by the type and value of the components. And what is the voltage across each of two components in parallel with the voltage source? This we know. They're in parallel with the voltage source. So therefore, it's the same as the source. And which instrument would you use to measure electric potential or electromotive force? Force, that's a voltmeter. That's the pressure. That's why we say 120 volts coming out, that's the pressure of the electrical current coming out of the, the wall outlet. And what is the correct way to connect a voltmeter to a circuit? Ammeters are in series, voltmeters are in parallel with whatever device you're trying to measure. And how <laughs> is a simple ammeter connected to a circuit? That would be in series, correct. And which instrument is used to measure electric current? The unit of measure is the ampere and the device to measure is an ammeter. Don't ask me why. <laughs> what instrument is used to measure resistance? Think of our friend buried in Munich. That's an ohmmeter. And which of the following might damage a multimeter? If you get left the meter in the resistance measuring mode, but you put it across active voltage, you let the smoke out. And which of the following measurements are commonly made using a multimeter? What we've talked about so far tonight, voltage and resistance. And what is probably happening when an ohm meter connected across an unpowered circuit initially indicates a low resistance and then shows increasing resistance with time? Remember that big capacitor we looked at before? That's what's happening. The circuit is, contains a large capacitor and you're charging it up. And which of the following precautions should be taken when measuring circuit resistance with an ohm meter? If you're measuring circuit resistance in a device, make sure it's not plugged into the wall and turned on, or you let the smoke out. And which of the following precautions should be taken when measuring high voltages with a voltmeter? Remember that big probe that we looked at? Ensure that the voltmeter and the leads and the probe are rated for use at the voltage to be measured. 
And that, ladies and gentlemen, takes us to intermission. Let's take five minutes. And that was a lot. You did great. All right, so we're through the hardest part of this chapter, I think. But um, I want to commend you just for hanging in there. Oops. Let me turn the, the PA back on. But I want to commend you all for just hanging in there. This, this is tough. Uh, I understand. Uh, but you're doing great. So we mentioned resistors. And we uh, used the schematic symbol for a resistor, this, this series of diagonal lines interconnected. And resistance, by definition of the book, opposes current flow in a DC circuit. And the little resistors are designed to have a certain value, and that value is measured in ohms. And it could be 1 ohm, it could be 10 ohms, it could be 100 ohms, it could be 1,000 ohms, it could be 100,000 ohms, it could be a million ohms, which is called a mega ohm. Um, so, and these are used in different electronic circuits for different purposes. Designers re require these resistors in order to design electronic circuits. So there is method in the madness. And we won't go over it tonight, but you see the, the resistors here, they have colored bands on them. There's a color code. And if you know the color code, then you can read what the value of that resistor is supposed to be. Or if you're lazy like most of us, we'll just get an ohm meter and measure it. Oh, that's what that is. Resistors oppose current flow. And an interesting thing about a resistor is that the voltage and current are in phase. If the voltage increases across the resistor, immediately the current will increase at exactly the same time. Well, wouldn't it always be that way? No. We'll show you that in just a second. A potentiometer, ooh, that sounds good. It's also known as a variable resistor. Uh, generally has three terminals, and the volume control on your car radio or on your, your radio at home may be a potentiometer. And what it is doing is varying the resistance between the elements, and by so doing, it's making a voltage divider and creating a, a way to control the volume of a, an AC signal that might be flowing through it. So potentiometer, also known as a variable resistor, uh, it has a resistance value, which you can buy them in different values, uh, and it's used for volume controls or other control circuitry. So we talked about capacitors. I had to mention them in the first section. And it, there's still two plates of material separated by an insulator. Now, those plates can actually be wrapped like a jelly donut around each other. And so that's how you get some of the higher value capacitors, is actually by using metal foil as the plates and have a, an insulating substrate between them and kind of wrap it like a jelly donut and then connect up to the two, the two plates with wires. And those are generally the electrolytic capacitors uh, that are, might be used as power supply filters and other things. But a capacitor is always two plates separated by an insulator, and the capacitance value is measured in farads. And you can have a, a millifarad capacitor, which is one thousandth of a farad. You can have a microfarad capacitor, in fact, back in the day, well, here's, here's some capacitors just to take a look at the various types. Um, and you'll find these in, in radios and things like that. So back in the day when I first studied electronics in the 1970s, it was physically impossible to build a one farad capacitor. It was a theoretical construct. But in 1970, there wasn't the technology to build a one farad capacitor. Now, you can go to Mauser Electronics, and here is a 3,000 farad capacitor that you can buy for $60. How far we have come with our technology, and how far things have changed. Now, it's only rated at 2.7 volts, 
but you could actually use this as a battery. If you needed something that you could charge and discharge, this would work. Capacitors can be variable, and in the uh, older radios, this is the kind of thing you would see inside uh, for tuning purposes. This is a variable capacitor with a, a rotor and a stator. The stator stays stationary and the rotor rotates and the plates mesh and have higher capacitance or they separate out and they have lower capacitance. And that's used to tune the radio, this variable capacitor. One thing that capacitors do, since there's no electrical connection between the two plates, is generally they block DC current flow. Now, there is that exception. We said that when you first apply it, it allows current to flow. But after the, the plates are charged up, then it blocks DC current flow. So capacitors block DC current flow. Capacitors resist AC current flow, storing energy in an electric field. Some people like to call this an electrostatic field, kind of like static energy. You, you get all the electrons on, build up on one plate and the absence of electrons on the other. And then if the current direction changes, well, all of a sudden the electrons start to appear on this plate and the absence of electrons over here. And that's why capacitors will pass AC current, but with some... Um, uh, I hate to use the word resistance, but they resist the flow of AC current through a property called reactance, capacitive reactance. And reactance is something that is measured in ohms. This is going to get confusing. Resistors are measured in ohms. Reactance, capacitive reactance, is measured in ohms. But they're not exactly the same. Capacitive reactance, uh, like I said, here if you have an AC uh, signal coming into the capacitor, the, the plates will fill up uh, with electrons on one side and absence, absence of electrons on the other, and then they'll switch back. And so that allows some current to flow through the capacitor. So capacitive reactance opposes AC current, but, but allows some to come through. And voltage and current at the capacitor are out of phase uh, due to the creation of the electric field. And that's as far as I'm going to go with that. When we get to the general class you'll, and extra class, you'll learn a lot more about that. So we had talked about capacitors. Now let's talk about inductors. What is an inductor? Well, what do these look like? These look like pieces of wire that are wrapped into a coil. And that's, in fact, what an inductor is. Um, and how many played when they were younger with electromagnets? OK, so keep that in mind. So there are various different kinds of inductors. The ones that we just saw there, which were air core. They didn't have anything in the middle. But you can have iron core, you can have ferrite core, uh, different styles for different purposes. But all of these are inductors. Inductor and coil means the same thing. And here's a schematic representation of inductors. Remember the resistor uh, was that the diagonal lines back and forth. The capacitor has two plates. Maybe one of them is curved, but uh, like that on the schematic. Well, these are inductors, and they kind of look like coils of wire. And are these inductors in series or in parallel? parallel. They're in parallel, correct. So inductance is measured in the unit of Henry's. This is Joseph Henry. And so you can, have, you can build a one Henry coil, uh, even back in the 70s. Um, and a millihenry is one one thousandth of a henry. You can you build coils of that value as well. So inductance is measured in henrys because inductors are, are pieces of wire. They will pass DC current. Remember the capacitor would block DC current, but inductors will pass it. Um, and inductors resist AC current flow, but they allow some through, but they resist it by storing energy in a magnetic field. 
Remember those electromagnets, which were coils of wire that you'd, you'd put a voltage to, usually a DC voltage, and, and you'd create an electromagnet. And so what you're doing is you're storing energy in an, a magnetic field with an inductor and an electric field with a capacitor. Keep that in mind. And inductive reactants resist the AC current flow. It's, and it's, that is called inductive reactants, and it's measured in ohms. So we have resistance measured in ohms, we have capacitive reactants measured in ohms, and we have inductive reactants measured in ohms. Confused yet? <laughs> and again, because of the creation of the magnetic field, the voltage and current in an inductor are not in phase. When the voltage is increasing on an inductor, the current might be staying the same or 90 degrees behind is what happens actually. So a special kind of an inductor, a special kind of coil is the transformer. And a transformer is actually two coils that are mounted on the same core material. And here we see a transformer with um, a primary on the left and voltage comes in, AC voltage. Uh, and you see the large number of windings in red there on the left. And if you look on the right hand side, you see fewer number of turns on the right. Uh, that's the secondary side. And the voltage on the primary, um, the, the number of turns is important because the turns ratio, the ratio of turns on the primary versus the turns on the secondary, tell you what the voltage will be on the secondary. So in this case, there are more turns on the primary. This tells us that this is a step down transformer. So if we were connect, connected to 120 volts, the output side might be 12 volts. This would be a 10 to one turns ratio, a step down transformer. Now, if you flip the transformer around and put the primary voltage coming in on the fewer turns, that would be a step up transformer. And that's what Tesla decided that was possible, is that you could actually step up AC voltages to very high voltage levels. And with high voltage, transferring it over a wire over a long distance, there are very low losses. So you didn't have to have a DC power plant on every block. Rather, you could have one main power generating station, uh, maybe at Niagara Falls with turbines generating AC, and you could transfer it over high voltage lines all around New York. So that's, that's what the beauty of, of the Westinghouse or the Tesla system. So a transformer that consists of two coils on a central core. And in a schematic diagram, this is how it would look. You have the AC plug on the left, a switch, a fuse. What do you think the fuse is there for? Safety. Safety. You want to prevent fires. You want to make sure that you don't have a problem. So you know what the normal current should be through this circuit. So you'll select a fuse value just slightly above that. But if more current than designed it starts to be pulled by the circuit, the fuse will open and protect your, your house and keep the smoke from coming out. Exactly. So we see the transformer and we see on the schematic, you see the large number of turns on the left and the fewer number of turns on the right. What do you think this is? This is a step down transformer, taking a high voltage, 120 volts down to some lower AC voltage. Okay. If you've got a stereo system at home or in, in your car or whatever, and you buy speakers for it, and the speakers are rated either four ohms or eight ohms is probably the most common, or even 16 ohms on some older systems. What they're talking about there is impedance. And impedance is a combination of resistance and reactance inductive reactants because of the, the speaker's a coil of wire. 
So there's the DC resistance of the wire and there's the inductive reactance of the coil. But because the, the current and voltage are not the same uh, in an inductor as far as being in phase or out of phase, they're out of phase, then you can't just add resistance to reactance. You actually have to do it graphically. And so this is, impedance is the opposition to AC current flow caused by the combination of resistance and reactance. And it can be, like in the case of the speaker, inductive reactance, or it could be capacitive reactance as well. And the impedance unit of measure is the ohm. The ohm. They're not exactly the same, but they're similar. All right, we'll come back to that a little bit. Switch types. The most common type of switch is a single pole, single throw. That's what the SPST means. And you see up there, you've got just one circuit and one switch element. So it's a single pole and it just goes on or off. Well, down below is something called single pole double throw. And that's uh, where you've got one input but two possible outputs. And uh, so these are very common switches. Uh, these are the ones that you used uh, by electricians at the, the top and bottom of a stairs. So you can turn on the light, you can walk up the stairs, and then when you get to the top, you can throw another one and it goes off. So that's what those are. So these are the only kind of switches there are, right? Uh, no. There's then on the top, we're looking at a double pole single throw. That's where you have one mechanical switch, but it actually controls two circuits at the same time, which can be kind of handy. And then the granddaddy of toggle switches is the double pole, double throw. Two, two, two switches in one, anyway. So you might want to, you know, we'll send you this uh, in the email. You can puzzle over these, uh, but you can see how the circuits go in different directions through these switches. Could those go even more than that? You can, but it's, it's highly unusual. In common usage, double pole, double throw is, is about the, the most. So then there are things called relays, and a relay is an electronically controlled switch. In this case, it's got a, an electromagnet, a solenoid, and when you put DC power to the solenoid, it actuates the mechanical switch element. And so this is a pictorial of a, a relay. Um, and here are some photos of some actual relays. And you can get them in different configurations, single pole or double pole, um, and, and various voltage ratings as well. We talked about the fuse. And uh, so fuse is one kind of protective device. Circuit breakers are another kind of protective device for, for AC power systems in homes or businesses. And you want to make sure that you always use the proper size. So if you've got a device and it's got a 5 amp fuse and you look down and you see it's blown, well, you don't have another 5 amp fuse. But I got a 20 amp fuse. Shall I put the 20 amp fuse in there? Uh, no, you don't get the protection the desired protection. It might work for a while, but it might also heat up something and let the smoke out. I told you this is a college level class. and We're now jumping into semiconductors. Oy vey. So we talked about insulators, which will not pass current flow readily, and uh, conductors, which will pass current flow. Well, there's an intermediate kind of device, a, a semiconductor. And it's a specific kind of material uh, that um, we won't go into the details of. But um, the most common kind of semiconductor device is the diode. And it will consist of one type of uh, semiconductor material, a P-type, right next to N-type material. And what happens with a diode, it allows DC current flow in one direction, you can see on the schematic diagram up on the top there, you see the arrow symbol. So current flows from positive to negative and flows from left to right in this case. If you notice the pictorial down below, you notice the stripe on the edge of the diode. 
That stripe is the same as the line on the schematic diagram up above, and that shows you the orientation. So with that diode connected with positive on the left, current will flow. But if you connected positive on the right-hand side, current would not flow. So that's a diode. It will allow current flow in only one direction. And you use these diodes to convert alternating current power, like coming out from the wall or coming from a transformer, to pulsating DC. Well, why would you want that? Well, pulsating DC can then be further filtered and regulated. And when it's filtered and regulated, the start with the AC waveform on the left. You see then they're pulsating DC pulses. Then you go through a filter, and it's got a little bit of ripple on it, but it's almost DC. And then it goes through a voltage regulator device, and you get pure DC to power your smartphone or to power your TV or whatever else that might require DC to power the circuit. So you're converting AC to DC using diodes and other devices. A special kind of diode is the light emitting diode. Uh, and I looked up, uh, these were actually invented in the 1920s, but not in practical use. Um, but uh, a diode like the conventional diode only allows current to flow through in one direction. And when the LED, light emitting diode, is forward biased or when its f current is flowing through it, it will emit light. And pretty much LEDs have eliminated the, the use of uh, lamps and bulbs uh, as indicators. LEDs are now indicators to tell you, you know, am I charging? Uh, is it on? Um, you'll find LEDs all sorts of different places. And they come in various different colors as well. Moving on, transistors. The name comes from the term transfer resistor. Um, and we said the diode had P-type material and N-type material next to each other. Well, if you go one more layer, if you go P, N, and then P, if you have three materials, that is what makes up a transistor. And an input voltage or current to a transistor can be used to control uh, voltage on the output. And so a transistor can be used as an amplifier to amplify a small signal up to a larger signal, or it can be used as an electronic switch. Uh, so those are the two functions of a transistor. And the most common or the first transistor was a bipolar transistor with P, N, and P material, or N, P, and N material. Um, and the bipolar transistor has three terminals on it, the base, the collector and the emitter. Those are the names of the three terminals on a bipolar transistor, base, collector, and emitter. And you can have PNP types or NPN types. We're not gonna go into it more than just to introduce them to you. And this is what they look like, and you, you've probably seen them on circuit boards and things like that. Notice the three terminals. And the larger transistor there is probably a power handling transistor, which might be used um, for the output section of a radio or high-powered amplifier, for example. And this is a transistor in a schematic diagram. This is actually a working circuit. And you notice the uh, AC input signal on the left. It's, it's kind of small, only about uh, 25 millivolts. And you notice the output on, is about 2.5 volts. So what do you think this transistor is being used as? It's an amplifier. It's showing it has gain. Uh, it's taking that small 25 millivolt signal and, and taking it up to a much larger signal. So this transistor is being used as an amplifier. So we talked about the bipolar transistor, which is the first kind of transistor. There's another kind of transistor called the field effect transistor. Um, and the three terminals on a field effect transistor are called the source, the gate and the drain. And this is a, the bipolar transistor is kind of a, a current operated device, a low impedance device. Field effect transistors are voltage operated devices, uh, more akin to a vacuum tube. Um, and here's a, a 
pictorial of, of how you can make field effect transistors. There's a lot more we could go into. There are different types, but we're not going to do that. And here in the middle of the schematic diagram is a field effect transistor surrounded by two bipolar transistors. Uh, and here we have a square wave input pulse is coming in and a ramp voltage is coming out on the, on the output. So in this case, the field effect transistor is probably being used as a switch. And then integrated circuits. Wow, we're moving at lightning speed. Integrated circuits are just circuit devices that have a number of transistors or diodes or other components built into one package. So you don't have a lot of different transistors out. You've got an integrated circuit. All right, here is a key circuit for radio or for television or for any radio frequency application. Resonant circuits. Remember I told you about capacitors and I said that the current and the voltage were not in phase. They were kind of 90 degrees out of phase. And I mentioned, oh, the same thing with an inductor that uh, the, the current and voltage are not in phase. They're actually 90 degrees out of phase in the opposite direction. Well, when you put them together, when you put an inductor and a capacitor together, you can make what is known as a resonant circuit. In the case of a series resonant circuit, depending on the values of those components, they will, and, and that's on the left, the series resonant circuit, at one particular frequency, current will flow through that circuit like it wasn't even there. But at all the other frequencies, it will not pass current. So that's a series resonant circuit that will pass current at only one frequency. The parallel resonant circuit on the right will block current flow at one frequency, but pass current flow at all of the other frequencies. And so a resonant circuit makes up the tuned stages of most every radio or uh, electronic device that you can think of. Resonant circuits are involved. This is an advanced subject that we won't go much further into. Here we're just looking at um, the, the impedance of the inductor and the impedance of the capacitor. And it turns out at the resonant frequency, they're equal. They're equal but opposite. And they actually cancel each other out. And in a parallel resonant circuit, uh, when they're equal, then it will block current flow at that resonant frequency. And we talked about impedance, and we talked that it's the combination of resistance and reactance. And one way to express it is using polar coordinates. Just be aware that that exists. You can't add them together. You have to do it vectorially. All right, so ohms review. Resistance is measured in ohms. Capacitive reactance is measured in ohms, but they're not the same ohms. Inductive reactance is measured in ohms, and impedance is measured in ohms. That's what you need to know. And resistance is the opposition to DC current flow, according to the book and according to the test. I'll tell you a little secret. Resistance also opposes AC current flow, but okay, I didn't tell you that. Resistance opposes DC current. Impedance opposes AC current. Let's answer some questions. So what is the purpose of a fuse in an electrical circuit? To interrupt power in case of an overload, overcurrent situation. And why is it unwise to install a 20 amp fuse in the place of a 5 amp fuse? Excessive current could cause a fire and let the smoke out. And what is the ability to store energy in an electric field called? Electric field, what did you say? D is in dog, correct, yep. Capacitance. 
And what is the basic unit of capacitance? The farad, correct. And what is the ability to store energy in a magnetic field called? Remember? It's called inductance. The coil has inductance and the coil is making an, a magnetic field. And what is the basic unit of inductance? That's Mr. Henry, the Henry. And what is meant by the term impedance? By definition, it is the measure of the opposition to AC current flow in a circuit. And what are the units of impedance? Yeah, that's right. And what electrical component is used to oppose the flow of current in a DC circuit? That would be a resistor. And what type of component is often used as an adjustable volume control? That's a potentiometer or variable resistor. And what electrical parameter is controlled by a potentiometer? <laughs> You're right, it's resistance, yep. And what electrical component stores energy in an electric field? Capacitor, Capacitor with the plates, that's an electric field. And what type of electrical component consists of two or more conductive surfaces separated by an insulator? That's the capacitor. And what type of electrical component stores energy in a magnetic field? Inductor or coil, yep. And what electrical component is usually composed of a coil of wire? Oh. That would be the inductor. I gave that one away. And what electrical component is used to connect or disconnect electrical circuits? Switch. That's a switch. And what electrical component is used to protect other circuit components from current overloads? That's a fuse. And what class of electronic components is capable of using a voltage or current signal to control current flow. It can use a small signal to control current flow. The only device that has that capability would, in this list would be a transistor. A small signal coming in can control a large signal going through it. And what electronic component allows current to flow in only one direction? That's the diode. And which of these components can be used as an electronic switch or amplifier? That's a transistor. It can be used as a, an amplifier or a switch. Correct. And which of the following components can be made of three layers of semiconductor material? Three layers is a transistor, two layers is a diode. And which of the following electronic components can amplify signals? Transistor, transistor again. Transistor can have gain, so it can amplify signals. And how is the cathode lead, the cathode lead of a semiconductor diode usually identified? That's that stripe. And what does the abbreviation LED stand for? Light emitting diode, bravo. And what does the abbreviation FET stand for? That's that second kind of transistor, the field effect transistor. And what are the names of the two electrodes of a diode? I didn't specifically mention this. Anode and cathode is correct, and it comes from uh, actually vacuum tubes. And which of the following could be the primary gain producing component in an RF power amplifier? 
power gain. Power gain requires gain, requires amplification. Transistor. You can have a RF power amplifier made up of transistors. The transformer will change the voltage, but it won't change the power. So what is the term that describes a device's ability to amplify a signal? That's gain, yep. And what is the name of an electrical wiring diagram that uses standard component symbols? That's a schematic diagram, correct? All right, you ask about pictures, here we go. So look at component number one, put that in your mind, and which of these four would it be? Everybody see it? That's a resistor, that's right. All right, and component number two, put that in your mind. That's a transistor. It's got a base collector and emitter leads coming out of it. And what is component three? Well, look at it again. And then choose from this. That's a lamp. Yeah. We'll, we'll see in the LED here in a minute. And what is component four? Uh, look at component four. That's a, yeah, you, it's a battery. So there it is. Yep. Yeah. All right, another diagram. What is component six? That would be a capacitor, correct. You can have straight plates or you can have one of them curved. That's fine. And what is component number eight? It looks like a, a diode with some things coming off, and those things coming off are the photons. So that's a light emitting diode. So that's what a light emitting diode symbol is. See it there in number eight. All right, and what is component number nine? It's a resistor. It's a variable resistor. It's got that arrow there. So yeah, you can change the value of it. And component number four? That would be a transformer. And component number three, look at it. Yes, indeed. It's an inductor, but it's got a tap on it, so you can vary its inductance. That's a variable inductor. And component number four, what do you think? That's an antenna. We didn't talk about it, but that's what it is. And what do the symbols on an electrical circuit diagram, schematic diagram, represent? The symbols on the diagram represent electrical components. We just named a bunch of them. And which of the following is accurately represented in electrical circuit schematic diagrams? What's accurately represented is the way the components are interconnected. It doesn't tell you anything about wire lengths or it doesn't tell you anything about how the components look. It just tells you how they're interconnected. And which of the following devices or circuits changes an alternating current into a, a varying direct current signal? It's made up of diodes and it's called a rectifier. Could be a full wave bridge rectifier or could be other kinds, but that's what takes the AC and converts it into pulsating DC. And what is a relay? An electrically controlled switch. All right, back to diagrams. What type of switch is represented by component three? And your choices are single pole, single throw. It's the most simple kind. And which of the following displays an electrical quantity as a numeric value? Could be analog, could be digital, it's a meter, correct. And what component is commonly used to change 120 volts AC current to a lower AC voltage for other uses? That would be a step-down transformer, correct. 
And which of the following is commonly used as a visual indicator? Is it charging? Is it on? The LED. And which of the following is used together with an inductor, with an inductor, to make a tuned circuit, also known as a resonant circuit? So you have to have an inductor and a capacitor. An inductor and capacitor, either in series or in parallel, make up a tuned circuit, also known as a resonant circuit. And what is the name of a device that combines several semiconductors and other components into one package? Integrated circuit, or IC. And what is the function of component 2 in figure T1? So take a look at that, and then let me give you your choices. All right. The best answer out of these would be, let's go back to it, see component 2? The best answer would be C, to control the flow of current. And, and we look at that, there's an input coming in, and it's dependent on whatever that input signal is, whether the light will light or not. So it controls, controls the flow of current. Which of the following is a resonant or tuned circuit? What are the two components you have to have? Capacitor and inductor. Right, okay, so look those over. Which answer? A. Has an inductor or capacitor? That would be it, right there. And you can, you can make a filter using them. All right, last section, almost home. So, let's see if I, I haven't tried this out. I got a quiz. Yeah. You got a, you have a, you have a transformer with step up or a step down. Right. Where does an inverter come in? Okay, an inverter is um, a device that uses a, a DC power source, and by generating uh, an AC signal, it can then go into a transformer. So you can have a 12 volt DC source create a 120 volt AC source on the output. Right, is it, and they just call it an inverter instead of a transformer? Correct. Purpose? Well, it's, it's because it's got active components. It's that got actually transistors in there oh, okay. that are switching okay. um, okay. And, and then making an AC signal that can be, then be transformed through a transformer. Okay. So that's what an inverter is. Okay. So I was going to walk over to the, the speaker and get it to, to howl, but you've all been in a gymnasium or other room where somebody on the PA has turned the PA up too loud and it, it creates an oscillation, it creates a signal, and that's because you're getting positive reinforcement. Uh, if there's audio coming from the speaker into the microphone and back, and, and it's in a positive way, then it, you'll generate a signal. Well, that's what an electronic circuit called an oscillator is all about. It has an amplifier stage and a controlled feedback circuit and an oscillator will generate an alternating current signal on one frequency. So that's an, an oscillator, and you can have different types of oscillators. Here is a crystal controlled oscillator using just one transistor, but it's got a feedback circuit uh, through the, the, the crystal, and it will allow it to output an AC signal on whatever the frequency of that crystal is. So this is an oscillator. It generates a signal on just one frequency. We talked about filters. Filters are used to reject unwanted signals. One of the questions talked about the inductor and capacitor being used as filters. There are lots of different kinds of filters. Uh, we won't go into detail on these. Uh, here are some simple filter circuits using a capacitor and a resistor. Um, here's a high pass filter, which is kind of the opposite. And here's the, the frequency uh, response of, of the two filters. A transmitter, boy, we're just moving right along here, um, we ha is, consists in this case of an oscillator. An oscillator generates a signal on one frequency, and then it's got two amplifiers, a driver amplifier and a power amplifier, and in this case it's got a Morse code key, a telegraph key, and by turning the carrier on and off, and, and you're able to add 
information to that radio frequency signal. You're actually modulating the signal. Modulating a signal is adding information to a radio frequency signal, in this case, via Morse code. And so here's a depiction of modulation. Uh, the red signal there is, is the radio frequency carrier, and the audio signal, which is the blue on the very top, um, and on the, the second from the bottom, that's amplitude modulation, and you can see that the amplitude of that carrier signal is being changed by the, the AC signal uh, of the, the top, of the, the audio. And down below, that's frequency modulation. You're actually changing the frequency of the carrier wave. But adding information to be carried by a radio frequency carrier is called modulation. And on a, an AM, a broadcast transmitter, they do that the same way. They have a, a master oscillator, they have a, a driver buffer amplifier, they have a high-powered modulated uh, RF output uh, power amplifier, and they have a big audio amplifier uh, for, for the modulation. I think the batteries are going. Receivers. This was one that I lusted over for, for many years, uh, an old Lafayette. Uh, the super heterodyne receiver is the most common type of receiver uh, that you will find today. Um, and uh, it consists of a, a mixer stage which takes in one frequency and converts it to an intermediate frequency used inside the radio. So the mixer stage, a mixer is something that changes one frequency into another frequency. That's a mixer. And there's more information about a mixer. You have the input frequency and the oscillator frequency, and you get the sum and the difference signals out on the other side. This is more information than you need to know. A mixer just changes one frequency to another frequency. And in a radio receiver, the demodulator, that's something where you take that information that was put on the radio frequency carrier, and you get it back in its original form. That's a demodulator. All right, questions after all of that. We just zipped right through that, but let's see. So which of the following is used to convert a radio signal from one frequency to another? That's a mixer. The mixer is used to convert. And what is the name of a circuit that generates a signal of a desired frequency? That's an oscillator. There can be different kinds, but that's an oscillator. And which of the following describes combining speech with an RF carrier signal? Modulation. That's adding information to the radio frequency carrier. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the end. You made it. You made it through chapter three. Your brain should be smoking, but don't let the smoke out. Thanks very much. We'll see you next time.